So here's the deal about me, John T. Miller. My buddies all call me JT. I ditched the corporate grind eight years back to start my own business, and it's been a success story ever since. Now, Don's the breadwinner at a major company, climbing the ladder for 24 years since right after we got hitched. She's in their education sector now, keeping up with tech advancements with a ton of training each year. At 46, she's stunning. Doesn't look a day over 30 and still turns heads. She's 5'8", a mere 118 pounds, and you'd never guess she's a mom of two. She's up with the sun, pounding the pavement for six miles with her running crew from our neighborhood. Our daughter Emily, a 22-year-old FSU grad, teaches first grade down in Naples and has picked up her mom's running habit. She's even got a taste for my home-brewed beer and found a club for it. I join her when I can. Kent, our son, is wrapping up his last year at UF, eyeing a spot in my company. But I've told him he's got to get some outside experience first. Five years. Minimum. Don's not into beer. Hates the smell when I'm brewing. That's why I tie my batches for when she's on her work trips. She's off in Dallas now, so I'm crafting an English brown ale back home. Life seemed too good to be true. And boy, was I about to find out just how true that was. A buddy from my beer club, Bobby, needed a lift from the airport. Easy enough, right? But as I waited in baggage claim, I spotted some of Dawn's colleagues. Odd, Dawn wasn't with them. So I called her office line, something I hadn't done in ages. Her voicemail confirmed she was supposed to be in Dallas, but here were her colleagues without her. Puzzled, I met up with Bobby, shared my confusion, and he suggested I get in touch with Steve, another club member who happens to be a detective. Before ringing Steve, I tried Dawn, playing it cool. She fed me some line about having to stay behind for work, but it didn't add up. I ended up calling Steve despite the late hour. I didn't beat around the bush, told him straight that I thought Dawn was playing me for a fool. He promised to help after I explained the whole airport situation and Dawn's fishy voicemail. I had this sinking feeling that my happy life was just an illusion. So I had this chat with Steve, a detective buddy of mine from the beer club, about the whole Dawn situation. I laid it all out for him, her travel schedule, her routine when she gets back, and my gut feeling that something was off. Steve figured there might be something fishy going on too and he pointed me to a private investigator, Frank Jones, to dig deeper. The next day, Frank gives me a ring, and we go over everything. He's straight with me, asking if I'm sure I want to uncover what's potentially a messy situation. Do I want to know the truth no matter what? How far back should he look? And am I ready to face whatever comes out of this? It hit me hard, but I was adamant. I needed to know if I'd been played for a sucker, no matter what it took or what it would cost. So Frank's going to get someone in Dallas to shadow Dawn, and his team will snoop around the training schedules and touch base with those instructors from the airport. Meanwhile, he tells me to play detective at home. I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but I start with Dawn's dresser. Nothing unusual there. Her closet's next, packed with boxes. But I decide to hit the bathroom first. Again, nothing stands out. Back in the closet, I go through her clothes, shoeboxes, everything, but there's nothing that screams secret affair or anything weird. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack without knowing if there's even a needle to find. After turning my place upside down, the master bedroom, guest room, den, garage, and even the attic, I was no closer to the truth. That's when Frank showed up loaded with spy gear. We rigged the house with cameras and recorders, turned Don's car into a tracking device, and then kicked back with a cold one while Frank filled me in. Turns out, Don's teaching gigs are all over the place, sometimes three days, other times five. The Dallas class. A three-day stint. Her colleagues Tom, Paul, and Bev, they all flew back on Wednesday night. No fuss. Dawn's supposed to be just teaching, not handling any of the classroom grunt work. As I sat there, boiling with rage, I remembered something my dad used to say about keeping your cool. But man, 
It's tough. Dawn's been feeding me lies, and I'm determined to see her face the music. The house search turned up zilch, except for the fact that Dawn always rushed to wash her clothes as soon as she got back. That struck us as odd. We hatched a plan. Frank would grab Dawn's luggage at the airport, and I'd find a way to bust the washing machine so it wouldn't start up right away. Frank headed out, promising his Dallas buddy was on Dawn's trail, and would report back pronto. I couldn't stomach the thought of sleeping in our bed, so I crashed in Kent's room, tossing and turning all night. Next morning, I stuck to my usual routine, hit the office to clear my head. Frank buzzed me around lunchtime, and we planned a rendezvous at my place. He showed up at two, arms laden with files. The Dallas detective had come through, a full report, photos included. The plot was thickening, and I braced myself for whatever those files would reveal. Frank had this photo, right, of six people having a good time at a dinner table. Three men, three women, all paired up. He wanted to know if I recognized anyone. I squinted hard at that picture. And yeah, the only face I knew was Don's. He passed me some close-ups, and after a good long look, I tell him one of the guys looks kind of familiar, but I couldn't place him. Frank's next reveal was something out of a spy movie. They had cameras set up in the hotel, watching hallways, catching every move. These photos he had showed the whole group from the dinner leaving the restaurant, cramming into an elevator, and all of them getting off at the same floor. The ladies went into one room, and the guys into another, right next door. Come Friday morning, there's a snapshot of two women leaving one room, two men the other, and then all of them breezing through the lobby and out the door. They looked like colleagues or maybe old pals. Nothing shady. After hitting up a nearby restaurant, they all settle their own tabs and head back to the hotel to grab their stuff and check out. Frank's looking at me like he's about to drop a bombshell, asking if I'm dead sure I want the full Monty. Without skipping a beat, I tell him to lay it on me. He's got another file, and as he walks me through it, the Dallas crew had gone into those rooms with the cleaners, filming the whole nine yards. Here's the kicker. Those two rooms. They're connected. They swiped the sheets for DNA, collected used glasses for prints, and dug through the trash. I'm bracing myself for whatever those tests are going to say. The waiting's the hardest part. Knowing that these bits and pieces could piece together a picture of Dawn I never wanted to see. The Dallas P.I. gave us the rundown. Those hotel rooms were a mess, a clear sign of a wild night. We're talking about all four beds used and stained, the air thick with the scent of sex. We're waiting on lab tests to confirm the details. But in my gut, I already knew Dawn was more than just a bystander. It felt like a punch to the gut, realizing the woman I married could betray me like this. So what's next? Dawn's coming home tonight, and first things first, we've got to sabotage the washing machine. That's our move to keep her from washing away any evidence. It felt kind of good getting my hands dirty, cutting the wire, a distraction maybe, to cool the boiling anger. Back in the kitchen, Frank's getting DNA samples, mine, the kids, and he's digging through Dawn's hairbrush. When he asks for hair from the kids, a chill runs down my spine. Could it be? He's just crossing off items on a checklist, but the thought of my kids not being mine, that's another level of betrayal. We've got baby hair clippings saved up. One from each kid should do the trick. Frank's got another plan. Nab Dawn's luggage at the airport. Buy us some time. With her bag missing, she'll be late, wrapped up in reporting it. That gives me space to get my head straight. And then the real act begins. Can I hug her? Kiss her? Sit through her stories like nothing's wrong? Can I take her out? Sleep with her? All while knowing what I know. It's a performance that might need to last months while Frank's team does their thing unraveling Dawn's secrets. Could I pull it off? Could I live with the lies, the facade, just to get to the truth? I told Frank, yeah, I'll do it. I have to. The truth is all that matters now, no matter how long it takes or how much it hurts. Frank's wheels were turning. He had a plan. 
He wondered if I could head out on a business trip, something to throw Dawn off, maybe even catch her in the act if she was messing around. I thought about it, and then it clicked. I could visit a longtime client in Street Lewis. Tell Dawn I'd be gone from Monday to Thursday. Make it sound routine. Why the trip? I asked. Frank laid it out. With me out of town, Dawn might feel free to slip up, especially if she's been having her secret fun on the side. And since we got no ears in her office, Frank wants to bug something she always has on her. I'm drawing blanks until it hits me, her briefcase. It's not ideal, but it's something. Frank hands me a tiny bug to plant later that night. As Frank heads out, he drops one last task on me. Check Dawn's underwear for any signs. Stay cool, he reminds me. I'm trotting, but it's like a high wire act. I'm out on the deck, nursing a porter, trying to piece together anything else that might have been off about Dawn, aside from her laundry routine. Nothing comes up. Then, just as I'm about to head in, Frank's on the line. They've snagged Dawn's luggage. It's off to the lab. Remember, keep your head, he says, and that's what I'm clinging to as I prep for the evening's performance. Dawn rolled in, clearly worn out from her trip and fuming over the lost luggage, especially over a couple of pairs of new slacks. But she still found the energy for a loving embrace and the usual I missed you routine. Once she went up for her bath, I got the bug secured in her briefcase and tried to relax with some TV. But my mind kept replaying her arrival, trying to pick up on any clues that might give her away. She seemed genuinely glad to be home, which only made my act feel even more strained. I've got to get better at this deception game, or she'll read me like an open book. Pushing those thoughts aside, I got ready for bed, where we'd end up tangled in each other's arms, the usual post-trip ritual. Come Saturday morning, Dawn was out cold, probably because she wasn't stressing over laundry duty thanks to the missing luggage. And there I was, sneaking a peek at her panties like some kind of creep hunting for any sign of infidelity. Nothing jumped out at me, they looked just like any other day's laundry. After my own shower, I started the coffee and grabbed the paper, trying to keep things normal. Dawn floated into the kitchen, all smiles and rested, and I laid on the charm, offering her coffee and breakfast. She joked about her luggage, and I had to chuckle along. With breakfast done, I stepped outside to chip away at my to-do list. A while later, Dawn popped out, heading to the store, and I told her I'd be busy with the beer transfer. It's all about maintaining the usual routine, even when everything feels like it's hanging by a thread. Dinner at our usual Italian spot was like a scene from a movie where the lead characters are pretending everything's normal. We chatted about our trip, my upcoming Street Lewis run, and the lost luggage which she half hoped would stay lost just for the excuse to shop for more, except for those new slacks she liked. I played my part, talking up my latest homebrew venture. After dinner, it was like any other evening before a business trip. The drive to Street Lewis was my time to think, and while I usually ponder over business matters, this time dawn was the only thing on my mind. I checked in with Frank from the road, updating him on the weekend and trying to get a read on his thoughts. No news yet, but he promised to keep in touch. As the miles and hours slipped by, I needed to hear Frank's unvarnished take. He didn't sugarcoat it. He and Joe in Dallas both figured Dawn was in deep, likely for years. It wasn't just a one-time thing. These people knew each other too well. Their casual demeanor, the way they handled themselves, it all pointed to a long-standing affair. Frank said that outside those hotel rooms, the six of them were just friends. But once the doors closed, it was a different story. They knew how to keep up appearances, and that's what stung the most. It was a long-term act, and I was none the wiser. The last bit of advice from Frank was to make a call decide what I was going to do about Dawn and this whole mess. That's when I reached out to my lawyer, Mike, for the contact details of the best divorce attorney around. I brought him up to speed, and he said Dave Ford would be in touch. It's strange how life can take a turn. One day you're sharing homebrew and dinner plans, and the next, 
you're talking to divorce lawyers about the end of a marriage you once thought was bulletproof. Next, I called Mike Davidson, my attorney, and asked him for the name of the best divorce attorney in the state. I gave him a brief update, and he told me he would have Dave Ford call me. Checked into my hotel in Street Lewis, I made the routine call home to Dawn, letting her know I landed safely. Everything seemed normal, but beneath the surface, I was arranging the pieces of a different game. I touched base with Fred about our golf plans, trying to maintain the ordinary pattern of a business trip. Frank rang me up later that night checking in. I let him know that his and Dave Ford's reputation preceded them, and that I was gearing up for whatever came next. This was no longer a defensive play. I was ready to take the field. The next day was a blur of green fairways with Fred. A temporary escape. Frank's midday call on Wednesday found me with an open schedule, ready to head back home the following morning. When Dave Ford, the attorney and I finally spoke, I briefed him on the situation. He commended the strategy and acknowledged Frank's investigative prowess. The big question from Dave was about my intentions, and I laid it out plainly. If Dawn's cheating, I'm filing for divorce. Yet I needed the full picture from Frank's investigation to measure just how far I wanted to push back against Dawn and her clandestine group. Dave laid out the legal landscape, explaining a no-fault divorce could be swift and less costly in Georgia, especially since our kids were grown. Adultery charges wouldn't really leverage any advantage. It was a lot to process. I needed time to weigh my options on how to approach the divorce, to decide whether to strike hard or take the path of least resistance. The conversation with Dave was a stark reminder of the legal and emotional maze I was about to navigate. Update. With the unexpected arrival of Frank and Steve at my hotel room, I knew something major was up. Frank's expression was grave as he prepared to deliver the news, and having Steve there suddenly felt like a necessity, a lifeline. When Frank broke the silence, the words hit like a free train. The lab results were in, and they confirmed Dawn's active role in that sordid hotel scene. It was damning. Each woman, including Dawn, had been with all three men. My heart sank as Frank explained they matched the DNA from Dawn's hair to the evidence on the beds. I was reeling, lost in a silence that was deafening, my mind racing as I struggled to wrap my head around the betrayal. But it was the next revelation that cut the deepest. Frank's voice was hesitant as he told me that neither of my kids were biologically mine. That scream that tore from my throat was more than shock. It was twenty-four years of trust, love, and memories shattering in an instant. As I stood there, pacing, raging, I was barely aware of Frank and Steve's presence. My perfect world didn't just collapse, it was obliterated. What was I supposed to do now? Every plan. Every next step seemed pointless against the backdrop of a lie that spanned more than two decades. Struck by disbelief and battered by the storm of betrayal, I found myself in a whirlwind of emotions. The revelation about Kent and Emily and Dawn's decades-long deceit was more than just bad news. It was a seismic shift in everything I thought I knew about my life. The shock gave way to a cascade of feelings from the initial disbelief to a cold, hard resolve. Frank was right to deliver this news in person. And Steve's presence was not just for support. It was a necessary anchor to keep me grounded. In the quiet aftermath of the storm, as time seemed to pause, we laid out my options. With Steve and Frank's guidance, I focused on the path forward, on ensuring that this betrayal came at a high cost for all involved. Sleet was a stranger that night, but their company kept me from sinking, kept me focused on what needed to be done. My decision was crystallizing. I would see to it that each person paid for their role in this deception. My divorce from Dawn would not be a silent retreat. It would be a declaration, a public unveiling of her duplicity. Yes, it would drag my own pain into the light, but it would expose the years of lies that had masqueraded as my life. In Georgia, the root of a no-fault divorce seemed a swift way to cut ties. But now, it felt too quiet, too gentle for the depth of Dawn's deceit. The straightforward process in Georgia. File, wait a month, and then divide what once was shared. 
now seemed inadequate. The evidence we were gathering would fuel a different kind of ending, one where the truth wouldn't be buried under the guise of mutual consent, but laid bare for all to see. Facing the stark reality of Dawn's infidelity, I was torn between the visceral satisfaction of a drawn-out court battle for adultery and the pragmatic approach of a no-fault divorce. The raw desire to confront Dawn and her accomplices in court clashed with the counsel of Steve, Frank, and Dave, who all advocated for the latter path. It was a strategy that promised efficiency and less financial strain. The promise of saving time and money, along with the opportunity to still expose Dawn's infidelity, gradually tipped the scales. Back in Atlanta, we regrouped in Frank's conference room, laying out the intel we had, pinpointing what we still needed to uncover, and strategizing the most impactful form of retribution. It was there I learned that Dawn hadn't slipped up during my Street Lewis trip, but the past behavior of the Gang of Six was a different story. Their pattern of booking connecting rooms, the various combinations of members attending these getaways, it was a systematic betrayal. My frustration boiled over at the thought of their deception. I demanded Frank dig deeper into their lives. I needed profiles, marital status, children, paternity, employment, residence, a complete dossier on each one. The plan was forming to dismantle the facade of their secret lives as thoroughly as they deconstructed mine. This wasn't just about legal retribution anymore. It was about exposing a charade that had lasted nearly a quarter century. I had this crazy idea to reveal my wife Dawn's cheating right on our 25th wedding anniversary. Frank, a guy who knew her work schedule, was setting up a spy operation to catch her. It wouldn't stand up in court, but I needed to know the truth for myself. The perfect time for the big reveal was coming up. A class Dawn was teaching in Orlando, ending right before our anniversary. I told everyone that was when I dropped the bombshell. It was going to be our anniversary all right, but not the kind you celebrate with cake. This was a game changer for me. No more playing the clueless husband. It was time to show Dawn and her affair buddies what happens when you mess with me. I was ready to turn the tables and make them feel the pain they caused. Update. Frank just gave us the lowdown in Dave's office, and it's like something out of a soap opera. The gang of six, Dawn and her co-workers, have been sneaking around for over 20 years since they all started at their company. They've got this whole secret life thing down to an art. They recently had this work class in Washington, D.C., right? And Frank's team figured out their sneaky plan. Dawn and this guy, Henry, had rooms next to each other. They were super slick about it, never giving anyone a reason to suspect anything. They'd spread out all over the hotel, making sure they weren't seen going into each other's rooms. All day, they acted like they were just co-workers. But at night, they'd sneak off to their secret rooms. And get this, they only did it late at night, then sneaked back to their own rooms before anyone was up, except on specific nights like Saturdays and Thursdays. Their act was pretty convincing. During the day, they'd talk about regular stuff like where they were staying, what they were eating, what their kids were up to, and their spouses. No one would ever guess these were the same people hooking up in secret at night. They'd been playing this game for 24 years, hiding everything right under everyone's noses. Frank's team, operating with their usual efficiency, collaborated with the hotel's cleaning service to collect the necessary evidence. The aftermath of the encounters in those connecting rooms provided a wealth of DNA evidence. The bedsheets, saturated with the DNA of the gang of six, and the personal belongings left behind, painted an undeniable picture. George and Chuck's unwitting paternity of Emily and Kent was confirmed, their genetic markers unmistakably present in the collected evidence. The reality of their actions, once hidden in secrecy, was now laid bare in the most indisputable manner. George C. Thomas, residing in Richmond, Virginia, with his wife and two adult children, was about to have his life turned upside down by the revelation of his additional daughter. Similarly, Chuck, in Columbia, South Carolina, enjoying a steadfast marriage with his high school sweetheart, was on the verge of being shocked by the discovery of his extra son. Henry, 
with his twins in Little Rock, Arkansas, Joyce, approaching her silver anniversary in Miami, Florida, and Catherine's family in Knoxville, Tennessee, all of their seemingly content lives were reflecting the hollow perfection of my own before the truth came to light. The gang of six had everyone fooled for over twenty-three years, pretending they were happily married, but their little act was about to crash and burn. Seeing my own life fall apart was just a sneak peek of the mess that was about to hit them. Things were getting more complicated by the minute. Now, we were questioning who really fathered Joyce's and Catherine's kids. Chances were high that the dads were part of their secret club. Frank was racing against the clock to dig up the truth, and he needed answers before next Wednesday. In Dave's office, the air was thick with bombshells. Turns out Dawn's business trip to Orlando was just a prelude to our anniversary. And boy, she didn't care one bit about the 25 years we had been married. My initial shock was swiftly followed by a cold, hard focus on the reality of our relationships. Henry, it turned out, was the father of Joyce's daughter and Catherine's son, while George and Chuck had fathered Catherine's daughters. Joyce remained the only one to have a child by her husband, a single thread of fidelity in an otherwise tangled narrative of infidelity. After taking in everything, I started to feel this cold determination. Pretending to be the loving husband while planning Dawn's downfall was like playing a dark game. I'd gone through all the sad and angry stuff, and now I was all about being strategic, just a little longer, and I could drop the bombshell. It was kind of twisted, acting like everything was fine, mirroring Dawn's own deception. She had kept up her act for twenty-four years, so I figured I could keep mine going for a few months. I was never the type to play this kind of game, but now it felt like payback time. Frank's crew was getting ready to do the same spying they did in Washington, but in San Diego this time. However, I was really focused on what would go down in Orlando. That's where I'd show everyone what Dawn and her gang of six had been up to. Her staying there instead of coming home for our anniversary just showed how little she cared. The plan for Orlando was bold. I'd surprise everyone by showing up as the instructor on Wednesday and let the truth out in front of everyone. Dave and his team were getting all the legal stuff ready for the big day. As it got closer, Dave, Frank, Steve, and I went over everything. We made sure we had every angle covered. Frank's team would be there keeping an eye on the gang of six for any last-minute info. I was gearing up for the showdown. This wasn't just about exposing Dawn and her friends, it was about making a big statement. I was about to step up and change everything, and they had no clue what was coming. Update. On Saturday after Dawn left, I called up the spouses of her gang of six. I spun them a story about throwing a surprise for our 25th anniversary and asked them to join in Orlando. I arranged tickets for them, saying it was all on me. I then told Kent and Emily to come to Orlando too, saying we were going to surprise their mom. On Tuesday night, I sat them down and told them everything about Dawn, the affair, and that I wasn't their real dad. We all cried a lot and hugged. They had a bunch of questions, and I didn't hold back on the truth. I made them promise not to tell Dawn what was coming. I looked them in the eye and said I wanted them there when I confronted Dawn but I didn't want to force them. I warned them it might be rough because the news was going to hit the papers back home and I'd be saying some pretty harsh stuff to Dawn and her friends. I told them it wouldn't change anything between us. I loved them no matter what. And in my heart, they were my kids. Kent, with tears in his eyes, asked if I could ever forgive Dawn. Emily wanted to know why we couldn't just try to fix things with a counselor. It was tough to stay calm but I took a deep breath and asked them to imagine they were in my shoes, that the person they loved most had been lying to them for their whole life. It was to help them see why I couldn't just forgive and forget. In the end, I told them it was their choice to be there or not. I loved them, now and forever. I asked Kent and Emily to imagine they had a perfect life with their family, like a movie where everything was just right. You've got a great job, 
awesome kids, and you're doing all the family stuff like soccer practice and family vacations. Every day you're grateful for this life, thinking it couldn't get any better. Then I made them picture a different kind of movie in this one. Their spouse is in a hotel room, not with them, but with other people, and they're not just hanging out there picking cards. And when their spouse gets the ace of spades, they're super, but not for a reason you'd want. So I asked Kent, do you think your wife really loves you? And Emily, I asked her to think about how she'd feel if her husband was one of the men in that room. They were upset, tears in their eyes, really feeling it. I let them sit with that for a minute before going on. Then I hit them with the hardest part. This wasn't just a one-time thing in the movie. It's been going on for 24 years, four times a year. I even have videos to prove it, right on my laptop. I told them, right now, not even a mile from here, they're filming another one of those movies. I asked how they would feel if they found out they weren't the real dad to their kids, or if Emily's husband had kids with someone else. It's a tough thing to hear and I could see it in their faces. Then I finished up by saying, the person you thought loved you is skipping out on family time just to be with these people for extra days of, well, you know. It was a lot for them to take in, and I wanted to make sure they really understood why there was no going back to how things were, why counseling wasn't an option for me. It wasn't just about the cheating, it was about a whole secret life. I explained to Kent and Emily how their mom would stay two extra days just for Zex and then need a whole day to recover before she could be with her family. How much love, respect, and care does that show for her family? I asked them. It was clear that Dawn's actions had hurt us all deeply. Kent, fighting back tears, admitted he hadn't seen it like that before. He realized that he wouldn't want to be treated like that by his wife, and he saw how much pain this had caused me. I love you, Dad, he said, still unsure if he could face the confrontation. Emily was firm. She was angry and ready to support me, telling Kent that he needed to stand by us too. Mom chose them over us, she said, and that seemed to make everything click for Kent. I was taken aback by her passion, her determination, and I felt an immense love for both of my kids. Emily was eager to know my plan for the next day, so I told her about inviting the gang of six spouses to what they think is a celebration of our 25th wedding anniversary. It's going to be a shock for them, and I plan to let them see all the evidence for themselves. And by the way, I added, you've got some half-siblings you might want to meet someday. I wanted Dawn's affair to come to light in the most impactful way and for her and her friends to face the consequences of their actions directly from their own families. Update. The other spouses from the gang of six came to the hotel, and we all had a good lunch together, getting to know each other. Then at 2 p.m. with Kent and Tao, we headed to where Dawn's class was happening. Waiting for us in the hotel lobby were a lawyer from Dave's firm, a private investigator from Frank's team, and a guy to film everything that was about to go down. At half past two, a florist dropped off the twenty-five red roses I ordered. Emily and the other women thought they were pretty, but I could tell Emily was amped up and ready to go. I had to remind her to stay cool because I was the one in charge of how this was going to play out. We made our way to the meeting rooms at 2.45. Emily was raring to go. Kent was keeping close to her, and the other spouses were buzzing with anticipation. I walked into Dawn's classroom at 3 p.m. with the roses, and the camera guy John was right behind me. Dawn's face turned as red as the roses when she saw me coming. I cracked a joke about it, and the room laughed. Dawn put on a smile and introduced me to the class as JT, her loving husband. As I stood there in front of the class, I locked eyes with each member of the gang of six, spread out as usual, a tactic of theirs to avoid suspicion. Turning back to Dawn, I started my speech about making the day memorable because of our upcoming 25th wedding anniversary. But before I could finish, Emily and the rest of the surprise group burst into the room. The photographer snapped a shot right then, catching the shock on Dawn's face and the pure panic on the faces of her affair group. I couldn't help but smile broadly as I watched the scene unfold. Emily, full of righteous fury, was taking charge 
Introducing Dawn to the spouses of her affair partners, I continue with my announcement, mentioning the upcoming company anniversary as well, making sure to highlight that Dawn and her colleagues had all started around the same time. I made a big show of the whole thing, with John capturing every moment on video, encouraging the guests to speak on camera later. Taking a moment to breathe and calm my pounding heart, I took in the bewildered and frightened expressions of the gang of six. The stage was set, and it was almost time for the grand reveal. George, Henry, Chuck, Joyce, Catherine, please come up and join us, I called out. The group made their way to the front of the room while the rest of the class applauded. Emily stood by my side, and I could tell she was ready for what was about to unfold. Taking Emily by the arm, I guided her over to George. Then I said, Emily, I'd like to introduce you to George Thomas, your biological father. Dawn turned pale, and George's wife looked at me in disbelief, asking me to repeat what I had just said. George is Emily's biological father, I reiterated. George found his voice and questioned how I could be so sure. Extending my hand, the attorney placed three documents in it. Turning to George, I handed him the first document, explaining that it was a request for a court-ordered paternity test. Then, passing him the second document, I declared that I was suing him for 21 years of back child support and emotional trauma. Finally, I presented George with a copy of the lawsuit I was filing against his employer for failing to enforce the morality clause in his employment contract. I assured him that I already had DNA results from an independent lab confirming his biological connection to Dawn's daughter, Emily, and the court-ordered test was merely a formality. Addressing George's wife, I added, Don't worry, I have copies of all the evidence for you to use as you see fit. The classroom erupted in chaos. The other spouses, who had been unaware of the true purpose of the gathering, were in shock. Kent surprised me by stepping forward, standing tall and nodding in acknowledgement. I felt a deep sense of pride in Kent at that moment. So we proceeded to Chuck, where I introduced him to his biological father in the same manner as Emily. Kent, I'd like to introduce you to your biological father, Charles Kent Nixon, I said. The room fell silent when they heard Chuck's middle name. In the hush that followed, the attorney once again handed me some documents, which I went through with Chuck, just as I had with George. Chuck's wife also requested copies of the evidence for her use. In the classroom, things calmed down a bit since most people thought the drama was just about Dawn and her two kids, but I had a bombshell ready for the rest of them. With Dawn crying in her chair, I got everyone's attention again. This is not what you expected when I walked in, I said. But hang on, because we're just getting started. The room fell silent. I laid it all out. I told them about the gang of six and their 24-year history of hooking up during these classes. I broke down the parentage of all the kids involved, leaving no doubt about the web of lies and deceit. The room erupted into chaos as the reality of the situation hit everyone. I didn't go into all the messy details, but all the legal documents were handed out. The spouses got copies, and the gang of six faced the music right then and there. When I gave Dawn the divorce papers, I told her we were done. No calls, no coming home, and no trying to see me. After everything settled down and I was back in my hotel room, I thought about how it all went down. Emily had thrown off my plan when she wanted to confront her biological father right away. My carefully planned script was out the window, but in the end, it didn't matter. I managed to let the gang of six know that they were exposed. I embarrassed them in front of everyone. And the truth was out. It was a hard, painful day. But it was also the beginning of closing a long, difficult chapter of my life. After serving them with legal papers and leaving them to face their furious partners, I started to feel a bit better about myself. Then, a knock on my door brought me face to face with Emily and Kent. They had been looking after their mother, but now they were here with me, offering hugs and words of love. Emily, though angry and hurt, had the strength in her eyes. She told me she was taking Dawn home for a while. Despite everything, 
She felt the pull of love and duty to her mother. Emily's strength was something new I saw in her. She was fiery and resolute, and I knew Dawn would be in capable hands with her. Kent, sharing his pain and love, asked to ride back with me, seeking some normalcy amidst the turmoil. As Emily left to be with her mother, assuring me of her love, Kent stayed, and we shared a few beers, a father and son trying to find our footing on new ground. Update. It's been five years since the gang of six was exposed and their world came crashing down. They all got fired, went through divorces, and it seems like they're always trying to outrun their past. Every time they land a decent job, their history seems to catch up, and they're back to square one. They're working on mending fences with their kids, but from what I hear, it's a long road ahead. Their exes want nothing to do with them, except maybe for the occasional financial support. After everything went down, I couldn't stay in our old house with all its memories. I checked into a hotel and started house hunting. Kent came back to Atlanta with me, but he didn't stick around long. He's doing great in Dallas, climbing the career ladder and enjoying life, though he's kept his distance from Dawn, only talking to her on the phone every now and then. Emily's more in touch with him, and they chat often. The aftermath of the gang of six has been tough, especially on the kids. Trust issues linger, and I wonder if Kent will ever settle down. Emily's been dealing with Dawn in her own way, taking no excuses or lies. We've all found support in others who've been through similar ordeals. The kids even bonded with their half-siblings, and we're planning a reunion in Nashville soon. It turns out Emily and Kent's names tie back to their biological fathers, which only added fuel to the fire when it all came out. Their relationship with Dawn is strained at best. As for me, I've moved on from Dawn. We settled our divorce quickly. She got the house, and I secured trust for Emily and Kent with the money from George and Chuck. I didn't want their money, but I wanted them to feel the sting of their actions. I've been dating, hoping to find someone new to share life and love with. I believe in love, and I'm waiting for the day I'll have grandkids to spoil. Life doesn't stop for anyone, and despite the pain, you've got to keep going. Emily and Kent needed me, and I needed to be there for them. Life goes on, and so do I, looking forward to whatever comes next, and always, always remembering that cheating never leads to anything good. Payback really is a, well, you know. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.